everyone to our first forum lecture series uh, in 2015. Um, we're very honored tonight to um, um, have Douglas Cardinal uh, with us. And um, tonight's event is uh, sponsored by the, the founding sponsors of the forum lecture series. Um, I, won't, I won't go through the list tonight I, because I think we need to uh, move right into, the, uh, into tonight's event. We're gonna do things a little bit differently tonight. Um, Mr. Cardinal is going to present um, uh, a lecture and, and introduce you to some of his past work, but uh, concentrating really on some of the new projects that he's been involved in. And then for the second half of the evening, um, Mr. Cardinal will be uh, in conversation with uh, Maria Cook. Uh, Maria Cook uh, is with the Royal Architectural Institute of Canada, and she will be um, asking him some, uh, some questions. And then we'll follow that uh, part of the evening up with uh, some questions uh, opened up uh, from the audience. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Maria Cook. Good evening, bonsoir. Douglas Cardinal is one of Canada's best known architects. Douglas Cardinal est l'un des architectes les plus renommés au Canada. He has had a remarkable career. Doug was born in 1934 in Calgary. He studied architecture at the University of British Columbia and later at the University of Texas, where he completed his degree in 1963. In Texas, he also discovered an interest in civil rights. After graduation from architecture school, he returned home to Alberta and began his practice by designing basement rec rooms. His first major commission was St. Mary's Roman Catholic Church in Red Deer, which opened in 1968. This brought him national attention. Today, he has more than 100 built work projects across Canada and the United States. Some of his better known projects include the Canadian Museum of Civilization in Gatineau, which has been renamed the Canadian Museum of History, the Museum of the American Indian in Washington, D.C., and the Cree village of Ujibugamu in Northern Quebec, which won a Sustainable Design Award from UNESCO. His buildings are known for their curving forms, and to help achieve those forms, he became one of the first architects in Canada to adopt computer-assisted design. Much of Doug's work has been for First Nations communities. He has become a voice for contemporary Aboriginal identity. Both parents had European and First Nations ancestry. Douglas turned 80 last year, marking 50 years in practice. He is currently involved in changes to the Canadian Museum of History and recently did the design of a modest Aboriginal centre at Carleton University. The buildings which Douglas Cardinal has designed have been acknowledged by numerous awards. His personal, passionate commitment to architecture, environmental sustainability, and Aboriginal rights have been recognized with an Order of Canada, 17 honorary doctorates, and the gold medal of the Royal Architectural Institute of Canada. Douglas moved to Ottawa in 1984 when he was selected to design the Museum of Civilization. We are fortunate that he stayed in Ottawa. And we are fortunate this evening that he has agreed to share his current passions and energy with us. Welcome, Doug. Well, thank you. And uh, it's, uh, it's great to be here with you all and to, uh, to share with you uh, my journey in this profession. A great profession. And uh, of course, I believe that an architect should bring people's dreams into reality. It's not about my vision or whatever, it's about my client's vision, the people I serve. And because I believe 
that uh, bringing, you bring people together and all the stakeholders of a project and through consensus and working together, you develop a vision that speaks to their very core, that not only connects the people developing the vision, but it creates a vision to enroll all the people necessary to bring that vision into reality. So you're working with so many people in the development of the building. And I believe it's so important to bring people's vision into reality in a way that you're working directly with the people, uh, working with the user, like bottoms up planning from the people. And in that way, you're serving the whole society. Top down planning, from my experience, really does not really serve the people as much as working with the people themselves, developing the vision. So uh, without any preconce preconceptions, I evolve a design from the inside out, open to all possibilities. And uh, because I believe that if architecture is created, with the respect for the people and the environment, it can then raise the spirits of all those who are involved, as well as all those who enter the spaces. So just to give an example, my uh, first major project, uh, I started my office in 64, 65, I was commissioned uh, a uh, Catholic church. In there, my challenge was to bring the uh, new liturgy to the church. Uh, the idea that uh, we should be caring and loving people, uh, which is the foundation of the church. And the building I wanted to express, or Father Merckx wanted, was to express a, a church that says, I'm a Catholic church without a crucifix or a cross. He wanted it to explain the church in its very form, the feeling of the church. Um, he, he just wanted it to make a statement in itself. And so we designed this building from the inside out. The form and everything grew out of the interior and the challenge then was to build it within the necessary budgets. So uh, we used a brick as a form, filled it with air and, and trained lightweight aggregate uh, in four foot lifts. So we had the walls, as you see, up. Then came the challenge of the roof. And uh, we used a catenary roof form, a three inch concrete spanning 120 feet, as you see in these slides here, um, uh, with post-tensioned cables where we post-tensioned uh, the roof and lifted uh, 250 tons of concrete in space. At that particular time in the design, I, I say I needed this form and this shape for acoustic reasons, for liturgical reasons, and uh, it was so important to define the shape but to define this shape, I had to have 81,000 simultaneous equations that had to close. Try to solve X, Y, and Z. The mathematicians of the day said it would take seven men 100 years just to work out the calculations. And that's when we turned to computers. We found a computer in Chicago. It was all tubes. It was a building that was filled with tubes. And, uh, and uh, it, uh, it was, uh, and I believe, like, if you make a, a real commitment to make a project happen, the right people will show up, you know? When you make a very powerful statement and you present it to the world, it just seems that uh, the universe shifts a bit because you create the possibility it can occur. And we, as human beings, are marvelous creative beings. and. We can always find solutions to most difficult problems, I've found. And indeed, um, when I was 
you know, we were actually in the process of, of actually building the walls. We hadn't quite solved the problems of the roof. And I remember at the time, uh, Father Merck says, well, you know, how can I explain this to the congregation? And uh, I said, Father Merck, you know this is a spiritual act. You just have to have faith. <laughs> and so we were able to do this in that way. You can see the light cannon over the altar because it symbolizes uh, the, that Christ symbolized the altar uh, and, uh, and therefore the divine light of the whole space had to emanate from the altar. So all of these things uh, we did together uh, for, um, uh, spent a lot of time understanding the church from the very beginning. And we wanted to create something that uh, was, uh, expresses the church today. So that started my, my career. Uh, the church laid the foundation for my education and also laid the foundation for my, for my career because uh, uh, the church has received international recognition. And uh, it takes someone with a vision like Father Merckx and uh, Archbishop Jordan who wanted to, because you can't do architecture without a patron, without people like uh, our art requires millions of dollars of other people's money. And so there's a sacred trust between yourself and your patron. And just, uh, I had another great patron was Dr. Henry Anderson. He wanted to develop a, uh, a college in Northern Alberta. And in our urban planning, they had bought the wrong site. There was uh, a creek running sort of through Grand Prairie, but nothing was built on the other side. And so, I felt that what we should do is have the college across the creek, develop the whole creek as a park, and, and make it truly a community college with a natural setting. And, it, and we did that, as you can see in one of the slides, is this, it opens into a park, but on the other side is the community. So it's so important to design a building. I look at a building as part of a community, like. It has to work with a community. It can't be an aberrant form because it should be connected to the whole community. So I start from the outside. When I was designing this building, I started from the outside of the, of the city inside just to see how everything worked as an organism because you have to look at a building as an, as an organism. And why not design a theater that... All the walls and everything all add to the acoustics and the form and the shape, like a, a violin, you know, you, you shape the building according to uh, the instruments that are going to be played within the space. So you look at a building as a living being, something that's organic, something that uh, comes from the, uh, the function. But it's almost like a plant that, that that uh, grows, each cell grows for a function from the inside out. You put the plant on the site and it also is influenced by the built environment around it. And here in St. Albert, we also, uh, in St. Albert Place, they wanted a, a community center. They were, at first, uh, Edmonton was, was going to take over St. Albert and say, uh, you know, you're just a dormitory. You're really part of our city. And St. Albert said, no, we were here before you. We have a great history. And Edmund said, well, you don't have even a center. So they all, the whole community got together and they wanted a city hall, a museum, a performing arts, arts and crafts, and library, and everything to identify them as a city in its own separate form. And they all got together uh, and set up a series of committees. And we worked with all these committees and we had to work within an absolute budget of so many dollars, so many cents, because it was a plebiscite. And they had to raise all the taxes and each one had to pay 
for the raising of taxes to serve this community. So everybody was involved in this, in that community, and it was uh, a wonderful opportunity to, to work with people. Uh, the challenges in this was it was like right on, on the river, you know, next to the river, and so that's where they wanted the building. Well, it was a challenge in itself because there was an underground river right where they wanted it. So we had to put a whole bunch of piles down like a pin cushion all over and then put a concrete, huge concrete slab on it like a raft so the whole building wouldn't float down the river. So we always have these technical challenges, but we have the opportunity always of having amazing sites. So, and, and this was a, a very wonderful client. And they made the building a historical site. They won't change anything. And I said, well, you should at least change the colors because they're sort of early 70s colors. And uh, they know that's the way it is. So um, and this building here is... Uh, Opportunities Company, Alberta Opportunities Company, to promote uh, entrepreneurship. It was one of Peter Lougheed's uh, government initiatives in central Alberta. And there I was playing with uh, Pierre Luigi Nervi's sort of ferro-cemento process where you have, you build uh, forms, uh, uh, beautiful forms out of concrete and then you put them in place and then fill them full of concrete stru for structural reasons but you have a nice finish in the inside. And uh, so that's, uh, that was for the Alberta Opportunities Company. This is a house out west that is built within a hill and is heated by the sun and by the earth. And uh, as an artistic expression of, uh, of being nestled in the earth, but open to the south sun and uh, a whole, uh, as you see, a three-story house and a hill with a glass structure over the front yard. It's sort of like bringing a little bit of Texas back to Alberta. So it's always, uh, you know, a, a tropical climate inside the house. And uh, St. Albert Place that I was talking about was the first building we did on the computer. And it was, at that time, um, what was interesting was that they developed chips, 4-bit chips actually, and, and we were able then to somewhat afford to go into computers. <clears throat> I found the more, the larger my buildings got, the more challenging it was to, to build because I had to supply all the dimensions to all the contractors and subtrades. In order to meet the budgets, I had to uh, work with each of these trades so that they could see that I was not asking each trade to do any unnatural acts. That in a sense, they were going to follow their trade, but in a rather innovative way. So I had to know all about the construction of each uh, one of these uh, projects and how to integrate them. Because when I went to Texas, I was working with a firm, uh, a top firm uh, that was all trained in the Beaux-Arts in Paris. And they all had uh, structural, mechanical, electrical, civil within the firm itself. And so we had the, we looked at everything holistically. And, uh, and then they decided that uh, they would uh, uh, helped me in a sense. They felt I should graduate from the University of Texas, so they arranged my life so that I, I would work with them and go to school at the same time. So I learned so much from them. And, and so I realized the only way I could do my buildings was to almost think like a, a contractor or an engineer in order to look at a building holistically, or else I wouldn't be able to do these organic forms because all these buildings uh, uh, are about the same price as a box, these box structures. And I, and I personally feel that's why I decided to uh, be an architect, is because I, I feel that the boxes we live in are just very demeaning to our mentality and our existence. I feel that uh, the only place for people in boxes is when you put them in a coffin and put them in the ground, you know? 
So um, I believe they should be just six feet under. So I, I feel that architecture should be uh, beautiful forms, organic forms that, uh, uh, that express who we are as people. And, uh, and in this building, I, we developed a space science center. It's my seventh building on the computer. And we did it three, uh, five months ahead of uh, schedule and 10% and below the budget. Because we were able to then take all the parts and pieces and prefabricate them on the computer and uh, put it all together to build a space science center. And we wanted the best optics in the world. And at that time, there was an iron curtain around uh, the East Block. But they had better optics than the Americans or the West Block. So we went across the East Block and got the best optics for the star projector. Because why not, you know? Why have any limits at all in the vision that, uh, that we had? Uh, and uh, it was uh, a lot of fun to do. We learned a lot. and. We expanded our knowledge because when you work with different peoples and different cultures, uh, you you learn so much because we have so much creativity in each one of our cultures, and uh, and so it, it's wonderful to work with people from different parts of the world. Uh, when uh, uh, when they uh, set up the competition for the National Museum, we entered the competition. And uh, I, uh, I won the competition for the National Museum. And this meant that I tried my darndest to be able to, to do it from Alberta. Uh, and the first year, I was able to travel back and forth with all the uh, members uh, of, uh, of the house, you know, you know, going back and forth in the airplane um, from Ottawa to Edmonton. But it, uh, I found that the only way I could do this project, because uh, um, I, I had one year to do, well, less than a year. We started in March, and by that October, I had to make 80 presentations and get an approval of 50, uh, 15 government departments. And then when I presented uh, it to the uh, National Capital Commission got approval. I got, got a call immediately from Prime Minister Trudeau, and he said, "You are to be in my office tomorrow morning at nine, and we're going to approve the National Museum. And uh, so, uh, bring your models, drawings, everything else." So, brought all the models, drawings, everything, put in his office. We spent a couple hours there together, and he. Uh, until he knew every, everything. He, what he did was set up a separate crown corporation called Canada Museum Construction Corporation, answerable to him through Francis Fox. So he was the client. And he felt, and he, he said to me, you know, our civil service can't do anything right. And so I'm not going to trust the government at all to even have a hand in this. I'm going to have a total separate Crown Corporation, I'm not going to have Public Works involved or anybody like that. I'm going to, uh, you're going to sign a contract with this corporation. And, uh, and so, in a sense, this was his vision. This, and, uh, and, and also, the people of the museum. Um, I, I asked, I wanted to see the client, you know, uh, and I wanted to be able to work with the client on the museum. They said, you really want to see our client? Yes. And so, okay, uh, uh, be at this address at a certain time. So they ushered me in the stage, and then they pointed to the audience, which was just about like this, and they said, that is your client. And so it was a real challenge working with all the, all the people in the museum. It was really the first museum I've ever designed. I mean, I... I, I didn't even know when I started what collection holding was. I'd have phoned my sister, who is a curator, and say, what does this mean? Because every client has their own uh, nomenclature. And I had to really start from scratch on this one. So I was ushered to the prime minister's office. And he then presented it to, to cabinet. 
Uh, he brought it in the cabinet, and he said, isn't that great? Isn't that wonderful? Yes, Prime Minister. He says, well, good. Let's uh, approve it. And he said, we have no money. We haven't budgeted for this. And he said, I've been thinking this over. This is a time when there was a Cold War with Russia. And uh, he says, Russia is only a threat to themselves. They're not a threat to anybody else. He says, I'm going to take a frigate from the Minister of Defense at budget and put it on the Ottawa River, and that's going to be the National Museum. <laughs> and there was a long argument. <laughs> And so he said in the Minister of Defense, well, we can't do that. We made commitments. He said, go, go and look at the models. He says, you have a choice. Build some ship that's going to rest in some far off sea somewhere or put that and make it the National Museum. So he came out, looked at the model. He says, you're right. Let's, uh, let's, uh, let's go for it. So then the Prime Minister walked out and said, well, it's all approved. You're to start construction tomorrow. He said, Prime Minister, tomorrow? Like, he said, yes, this, that's got to happen. So I said, well, you know, these are just sketches. Uh, <laughs> you're, um, it's on a floodplain, uh, on an earthquake zone, and uh, it uh, has technologies that haven't even been created yet that you're asking for, uh, and you don't even own the site, you know. <laughs> <laughs> still belongs to La Belle Provence. So um, he said, how long will it take to work out all those things? I said, if I worked night and day, it would take two years. Uh, you know. And he said, uh, two years? This is democracy, he says. It won't happen unless you start construction tomorrow. So I'm asking you, I'm telling you, you start construction tomorrow. So I said, yes, Prime Minister. <laughs> So that's what we had to do. We had to build it all in stages. Every time we drew something, we had to put it out for tender. So we ended up with sequential tendering of some 240 some contractors, one after the other, like that. So it was like, sometimes, you know, you make a commitment and it doesn't make any sense, but you just make a commitment and you, and, uh, you make it happen. So uh, that was the challenge of the museum. And it's, it's uh, for me, uh, it was a wonderful opportunity to, to use all the technology that we had. We designed everything by, by the computer, all the parts on the computer, all the dimensioning. Without the computer, there would be no way we could have done this project. Um, at the time, when we first brought bought that computer, it was um, $250,000 for 512K. <laughs> That's half a megabyte. <laughs> and we had a disk drive that was the size of a, a um, washing machine that cost $60,000. And the disk cost 2000 each. So, I mean, it, it was... Um, but it was able to create buildings like this. This is amazing. Uh, we ended up, like I had to go back to Texas in order to get, for them to develop the software because everybody else said, well, it's impossible. But in Texas, you know, they say, huh, if anybody can do it, we can do it. They have this can-do philosophy. So they did it and they programmed the, the computers for us and so, uh, we were able to do these challenges. And this was uh, in the early 80s, 1983, uh, that uh, we started the project. And we were totally computerized in our office. And so uh, I think you have to, uh, to just be out there. And we have now this wonderful technology in construction. My friend Alex Jean-Pierre, he, he painted the dome, it's a beautiful dome um, and a beautiful painting. So with that uh, uh, opportunity of creating the museum, we were then uh, involved in uh, uh, the First Nations University. I've been working with First Nations. They wanted to create a, a building for uh, 
for developing a uh, university, taking their knowledge of thousands of years on the land and being able to share that with everyone. And so, indeed, they, they said, we want it out of stone like the museum. So that was their vision. It opens and embraces and open to the south. It just, its arms reach out to the south, uh, to the sun. So that was the shape and of the building itself. We did an overall master plan of the vision that they're still in working with at the University of Saskatchewan in Regina. Uh, the Queen sent her son to open the building and she uh, also went there and presented uh, a chief from the stone, a stone from her castle because she said we belong, our houses are united. So uh, this is a place also where we have a, a glass teepee. Right there we can have a fire in the center and the smoke goes in the four directions. That took a lot of engineering. And uh, here we also did uh, a center for York, for nine, uh, nine cities. Um, and working with nine cities, you know, it's a little more complicated than one city hall. You're working with nine. And uh, the, you had to develop a consensus. And it, it, in a sense, it, working, you can't do a, a building without many, many people and many, many talents. And uh, it, it's, it is an amazing opportunity to, to meet so many different talents and different people that, uh, that have very powerful and passionate visions. You know, that when you work with people, it, it's so interesting because they themselves are very passionate about what they want to accomplish. And you try to capture that passion in the buildings themselves. We did a casino in Upper State New York for the Oneida Nation, and uh, and we spent a lot of time in Las Vegas because they hired uh, the uh, CEO of the Golden Nugget, and so he was he had the science of how he had set the tables up and everything. Casinos are really an interesting design opportunity, um, and also it was fun to go to Las Vegas and 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 see all the shows. We have a Las Vegas showroom that they really like. We had to have perfect acoustics in there so people would love to come to this area and perform. Um, here, uh, the First Nations community in Winnipeg with the support of the, of the mayor wanted a place to, um, to heal and to get together. But in the middle of that space, they wanted a fire. It's like having a fire right here. Uh, that poses a lot of engineering challenges. And when we, at the opening, we had a great fire and it was uh, rising and they made it higher and higher and I thought, oh my goodness. <laughs> but the uh, smoke went out in four directions. The engineers were sitting there and I went, wow, you guys, you really did a great job. <laughs> because it takes, it takes a lot of talent to be able to uh, to be entirely creative like that. But we can go to the moon and back. How come we're sitting around building these boxes, you know? I mean, we, we have so much ability and so much talent, so much creativity. And also we can, you know, now take our computer drawings and whatever and send them to printers and they can print our models in 3D. I mean, that is amazing, you know? Here we had the opportunity of doing a whole village. This community, um, that we were working with in northern uh, Quebec for uh, Oshu Bugamu, who are James Cray people, Cree people. Uh, that's my client. All 500 people. They were totally involved in every aspect. The children, everybody. And we, our job was to bring their vision into reality. And, uh, and so uh, it was important to to be able to listen to them and bring the vision back, but say to them, we want you to evolve the vision to suit you. You have to be involved in this evolution of criticism and change because we still are operating from our own perspective and we want you to, to, to tell us how to improve it through criticism and change. 
Sometimes people know, uh, don't know what they want, but they know what they don't want, and that's valuable information that you should address. So we did it exactly the way they wanted it, in every detail. And uh, they won a uh, United Nations Award as the Village of the Future, and featured in uh, Hanover, Germany at uh, Expo 2000. So uh, that, that in itself was an opportunity to learn more about cultures that have been there for thousands of years. And then just uh, last year, we finished their cultural center, which uh, is a, a building that um, not only houses their, their uh, artifacts and their museum, but also brings back their language and their ceremonies. And so it's an opportunity to lay a foundation of, of renewal and bringing back into the world another culture that uh, was based on this land, of which we all can benefit from knowledge and learning from other people. And uh, so this is all out of wood and, and uh, of northern wood that, uh, that uh, is uh, an amazing product because we can use cross-laminated timber now to create wonderful buildings out of wood that, uh, that are almost any shape that we can imagine. Uh, in this community in um, Michigan, they were Ottawa Indian people actually from this area, but they ended up in Michigan. <clears throat> and the first thing they wanted for their whole community was a turtle. And I go, okay, um, we'll design a turtle, which they called uh, would be the center of their community. And it would be, have the 13 plates on its back, which would be the power of women and 13 columns on the inside all carved because they were matriarchal society. But we, we put it all together uh, in, a, in a structure here, a geodesic structure here in Ottawa, a tridentic structure. And we brought it all there and they put it all together themselves and they won a Best Building Award in Michigan. So this was the efforts of, uh, of those people. Uh, we won an international competition for the National Museum, the American Indian in Washington. And there I met with First Nations people from all over the Americas. And we got together in Washington and this was their vision. And of course our job again was to bring their vision into reality. So. Um, <clears throat> so we worked with, uh, with cultures from all over the Americas, and it was uh, quite an experience, and to be able to pull it all together, and also work with the people in Washington, because this was the last site on the mall in Washington. And so one had to develop this building that, that uh, was in harmony with all the buildings on the mall, but the first building to the left, as you, as you look from the Capitol with the Washington Monument at the end. So it's the first building that addresses the Capitol. So it was very important that it respect the Capitol, but have its own unique expression. So this balance between its own unique expression as a piece of sculpture on the mall, which is neoclassical. But neoclassical, always those forms were the original uh, forms of nature for the Greeks. And this building is the original form of nature from the Americas. So, well, it worked together. And, uh, and that's the kind of building they wanted, a unanimous approval for this um, design of the building in front of the Capitol. Uh, a very important adventure. So, <clears throat> Recently, we just uh, did, uh, for the University of Carleton, uh, a center for the indigenous people, which is more organic and more natural and uh, a more nurturing space. 
following the culture of the Anishinaabe peoples, the peoples here, they were always into caring and sharing and loving and, and being able to develop harmony with each other and harmony with their environment. And we wanted this place to be reminiscent because I feel that architecture should be a physical manifestation of where we're at, at a higher plane. You know, it should be art. It shouldn't be just mere shelter. Architecture has always been firmness, commodity, and delight, as Vitruvius said a few thousand years ago, that architecture should be delightful. And we need delight, and we need beauty in the world. And no, and no space and time as human beings, with all the intelligence that we have, we have never produced such ugliness in our urban environments. If you want to look for beauty, go look at the buildings of the past. But in the present, you know, most of what we build is very ugly. And uh, so I feel it's important, whatever we do, to build beauty and harmony. Um, here we, we developed a, a house uh, for northern people. And, uh, and the Chinese community saw this house and there it is, built in China, in northern China. And uh, we hope some time we'll be able to build these facilities here in Canada. We also uh, built a, uh, a design a hospital in Sioux Lookout, where we had some um, uh, 30 communities the size of Germany that this hospital served. So Doi and I went to each one of these communities and we, um, uh, we found out what their needs were and developed the hospital around their needs that combines uh, indigenous medicine and Western medicine. So we have the ceremonies of the, sh of the uh, healers and uh, traditions of thousands of years next to operating rooms and the latest technology. So here's the fun that our computers can do now. We look, we do everything in 3D. We, uh, with this building here, we're looking at, uh, at this extension here. Uh, we can model everything in 3D, build it on the community uh, uh, to exact scale. And in that way, Every piece can be defined, everything can be integrated, and so we build it virtually on the computer and then, and then in reality on the site. So this is the technology, this is the uh, center we did for the uh, First Nations, for the women. The theme of this was the power of water symbolizes the power of woman, and this is uh, very important in the development of this design. Um, right now, uh, I'm also working on uh, uh, William Commander's vision, ha actually have been for 30 years, where we, at first, we started when I, I came to Ottawa to do the museum. The first thing that we had to do is change the nation's capital, concept of the nation's capital, because we had Parliament facing one way with his back to the Ottawa River and Hall facing the other way with his back to the Ottawa River. And then here, uh, we wanted to create a circle joining uh, the Francophone community with the Anglophone community and also that green space there with the First Nations. So we'd have the three founding cultures um, here uh, in this circle. Uh, which, would, which is the foundation of how Canada was developed, the agreement between the First Nations and the French and the English in a circle. And, and Prime Minister Trudeau wanted the uh, museum on the Hull side of the circle, and Prime Minister Mulroney developed the circle, uh, Confederation Boulevard. And so there's always been a plan to have the First Nations uh, be represented 
on these islands. And because these islands were the spiritual center for the First Nations, uh, of all the First Nations, Anishinaabe people from the Atlantic to the Rocky Mountains and south, Ottawa was always the capital. And, uh, and that's why Queen Victoria chose Ottawa. And we had these magnificent uh, falls uh, that were industrialized. But now since the industry is over, we can open that up for everyone in Canada to enjoy again. So this gives you uh, the center of, of where the First Nations feel they would like their presence in the nation's capital. Right now, there is no presence of First Nations. We have all the other embassies around the country, but no presence. And this is what they believe should be their presence here in Ottawa with the development of, uh, of, uh, of the islands. And, uh, and this is uh, worked out from the last, actually, we started this when I started the museum, Jean Pigott, who is head of the National, Commit, uh, National Capital Commission, was the one that said, these, these are the place for the First Nations in our nation's capital. And Marcel Beaudry, head of the National Capital Commission, later on made this a priority. However, it still hasn't happened, but it will, because uh, we, we have that tradition. Uh, of these three founding nations that created Canada. Uh, these are some of my, my projects that I'm working with now. I can actually have more opportunities, stretch the materials more, be able to use uh, the latest software where we combine Revit and Rhino together in order to create these structures. Here we, this is uh, the legacy project for uh, Peter McKinnon, who's the president of the University of Saskatchewan in Saskatoon. He wanted this building as his legacy project. And so this is a very sculptural building in the heart of the campus. And uh, it, uh, it is a symbol of being in harmony with the earth and with each other, a, a strong sculpture. But as you see, it's every part of the building we've put on the computer, every uh, part of it, every steel member, every duct, every light fixture and everything is all part of the, uh, the structure and part of the design. And, and yet we can look at the whole design and see how the light works with it, how the interiors work, because we have a virtual building all on the computer with all the lighting and everything else. We can ask the computer, okay, what is, what, what is the lighting in December the 21st? And, uh, and it will show that. We can look at every detail inside and out. And that is what is amazing about the technology now. I'm so excited about uh, the next phase of architecture where we all are working now and sharing ideas together. We can have consultants anywhere in the world that can hook into our system and we could work together and create buildings like the one we're doing in Saskatchewan. Now we have a camera on the site and from our office we can see what's happening. They can wave to us on the computer and, uh, and we can communicate and talk to them and, and build everything in 3D. I feel it is such an exciting time and uh, I, I feel at 80, I'm very lucky to, to be totally involved in this profession and uh, I, I'm just having a lot of fun with my team in carrying out these ideas. So thank you very much. So we'll move into the second part of our program, and um, I'll just ask Maria and uh, Douglas to um, have a seat on the stage. And um, Maria has prepared some, some questions for Doug. 
and he's had a chance to, um, to have a look at them, so there won't be any big surprises, uh, I hope. Uh, maybe in the answers, we'll have some surprises. And then uh, following this, we will open the, uh, the floor up for, uh, for questions. Well, I think that was a, a really marvelous presentation, Doug, and, uh, and you covered a lot of ground. Uh, you touched on uh, the, the development of the islands, which is uh, a new proposal to develop uh, Chaudière and Albert Islands and, uh, and the shoreline um, uh, along the, the Gatineau Riverfront. A lot of people are very excited about this uh, proposal. It's for mixed-use buildings, condominiums, public space. You have expressed reservations. Why? Well, I feel those uh, islands should not be uh, uh, public, I mean private. Um, uh, it, it should be open to the public. And uh, those islands are very uh, special because they're an extremely sacred site for all the Anishinaabe peoples and all the peoples uh, that they traded with as well. And uh, the problem that I saw when I first came here in this capital that even Parliament or even the City Hall Hull didn't address the river. They turned their backs on the river. You have such a marvelous asset uh, with the river flowing through the capital here and it's not really being used. And those islands in the river would, would is so important uh, for all the people of Canada to enjoy, not just a gated development uh, of 2,000 people and high rises and everything all packed on those islands. It should have. <laughs> it should, it's, it's a beautiful natural phenomenon. Those uh, falls uh, were only second to um, Niagara Falls. And the reason why Queen Victoria chose this as a capital, not only for the fact it was a capital for the Anishinaabe people for thousands of years, but because of the magnificent site. And so uh, one should take advantage of the river and everybody should experience those falls uh, because they're rather magical. The people would come here for, uh, for many years and give offerings to the, to the falls, which would flow into a great kettle. And the mist would come out of that great kettle. Uh, it was almost like a sacred pipe. And so they, the people felt this was a special power center. And it is a power center. So we should bring that back. And, uh, and then let, and not kill the, the eels and the sturgeon and everything like that. We're, we're killing off these species by having that dam. And, and now that industry is gone, uh, you know, we're going from an industrial society to an information society. Well, then we can uh, not build a bunch of condos like on the shoreline of Toronto. Uh, which destroys that shoreline, but uh, and and where you you you're separated from from the lakes. But here, we should develop all that area for all the public. It could be our own beautiful little Stanley Park right in the right in the middle of the Ottawa River, where we all can enjoy it. You, you've touched on the the significance to First Nations people to uh, the importance of, um, of uh, this remaining public space. What is the urban design argument? Why shouldn't this be a place for, for this kind of development? Well, if you put 2,000 people on there, a high rise and everything, what about the parking? What about uh, how do you access it? Um, you know, we're already polluting the river more than we should. Uh, we have to clean up that river. Um, so uh, I think that what we should do as a, uh, in this, in the, at the capital here 
is, uh, is uh, set an example because it doesn't make any sense in urban planning to put condos on that site in the center of that island there uh, next to those beautiful falls there. And the reason why people don't appreciate those falls is that nobody was able to see them. They were all shut off. You wouldn't be able to approach the site because it belonged to Domtar. Mm -hmm. And it would be like fencing off Niagara Falls and saying, you don't get to see that site because it's an industrial site. Well, people just love just to come there and experience those falls. And uh, those falls and those islands should be given back to the people, not for private development. It should be given back to the people. And, and it doesn't make any urban sense whatsoever to, to provide that many people on those, those uh, islands. You had mentioned Confederation Boulevard as a, an idea of the joining of, of the, the First Nations, uh, the, the French and the English. Yeah. Um, how, how is that connected to, to, to the islands and the landscape there? Well, we have, uh, we created that circle. I was very much part of that, uh, uh, working with the National Capital Commission, where this country was formed by the English and the French and the First Nations. And, and to have them together in a circle, working together, uh, where each group makes their contribution with their culture to all the people in Canada and all the people that have come here from other cultures to participate in this great experience of, of living in peace and harmony together. Uh, this is, can be an example to the rest of the world because the land itself, for people that have lived here thousands of years in peace, that was their culture. They embraced everybody who came and said, welcome to our land and welcome, we'll share the land with you. And treaties were formed and uh, agreements uh, were made. And uh, yes, those agreements were broken, but now the people have the opportunity of, uh, of being able to defend their rights uh, in the interests of all Canadians. And, and you have filed, uh, uh, you, you filed an appeal at the Ontario Municipal Board. Yes, on behalf of the, uh, of the people that want that site to be uh, a First Nations site on the circle. After all, all this land is unceded First Nations territory, Algonquin territory, by law by the treaties, this land was unceded. Okay, they shared this land with everybody else in Ottawa and Hull. How about letting them have at least their sacred islands back so that they could be properly represented in our nation's capital? Well, I think I'd like to maybe just ask one more question, and it's about uh, some of the changes that are taking place at the Canadian Museum of History, which you are involved with. I wonder if you could tell us how the design is changing and, and how it's going to reflect uh, the new purpose of the museum. Well, um, our Canadian history, um, in the History Hall in the museum at the time, uh, 30 years ago, um, decided that history started from contact when the Europeans met the First Nations. So they decided that that was when history started. But the Museum uh, of History has decided that history started from the last ice age when the first peoples came to this land. And so it's a much broader view of history. It includes the First Nations. It includes the agreements between the First Nations and the people that they share the land with. So um, the Canadian history 
uh, you know, what, we're, what we propose on, uh, on uh, the islands is consistent with what we're going to do with the history hall. We're going to present history in that way. And indeed, in my concepts, which have approved, the inside of the history hall uh, reflects the flow of the Ottawa River, reflects the great kettle, which is the symbol of our capital back thousands of years ago, as well as today. So we're carrying history back uh, to uh, our historical roots. And I think that's uh, a very exciting uh, way that we're showing our history because um, it's an opportunity for indigenous people internationally to see that in this country uh, we have respected our indigenous roots. Thank you, Doug. I'm sure there are questions for you from the audience. Wow. Um, I think I have a, an important question. Uh, I've worked with architects earlier on, and there's architecture students here and obviously architecture faculty. Now, there was a presentation a year or two ago, a young group from out west, and they'd won a competition and build a C children aid society building, which was stunning. And they'd won the competition on price. They built it under budget. And then the client freaked out because it was so gorgeous. So I'd like you to address the fact that you seem to build gorgeous buildings at the same price as boxes. So conceptually, what's the issue? Well, yes, like, uh, like that First Nations University, um, the reason we are able to uh, compete with the boxes is that uh, in uh, most of these buildings that are designed uh, uh, they don't think out uh, how you build a building sequentially. Uh, for example, a trade will come in and do 10%, another trade will come in and do 15%, and then that trade will come back and do his other 10%, another trade comes in and does 20%. It's chaos because nobody's thought through the whole building sequence. And I realized when I first did my the church, the budget was 357, and when I put it out for tenor, it came in 800,000, okay. I could see it, it wasn't that way, so I, bro I, I broke it all up into trades, and I sat down with each trade, and I worked out a, a sequence of construction, and then, uh, so a trade could come in, uh, do his work, move out and get paid. Another trade could come in, the same way, sequence it properly. And then I also noted that uh, in construction, uh, the, uh, the architects stamp the drawings of all the uh, shop drawings and say not, we don't, uh, the, the uh, dimensions are not our responsibility. They're the responsibility of the general contractor. The general contractor gives the responsibility of all the dimension to each trade. So then what happens when they put in their shop drawings, you get a whole new set of drawings that are totally uncoordinated, and all the dimensions and everything are, are, are all different. So then you start building a building like that. Absolute chaos. So, um, so what we did on the computer was sequence the, uh, the construction, and we took the responsibility of providing all the dimensions for everything, even the glass and everything, because our computers can uh, uh, develop our drawings within 15 decimal places. Well, give that information to all the contractors, for heaven's sake. I mean, even on the museum, when, when we did these forms on the museum, um, uh, and we wanted to do these forms out of steel, the steel supplier said, how am I going to do the shop drawings for this? So then finally we said, easy, we're going to give you all the dimensions. And we gave them all the dimensions so that they could, they could do that. 
So on our First Nations University, designed by, uh, by ourselves with PCL as contractors, uh, our price was $200 a square foot for that very sculptural stone building. Next to it was an ugly box, uh, which was, of course, all chaos, which is so traditional, uh, the way things are built, and it cost two twelve. dollars So the National Museum in Ottawa, uh, the uh, cost for museums at that time were $250 a square foot for the building shell. We built the National Museum, which is a million square feet, for $165 million for the shell. That's $165 a square foot. Uh, we were under conservative government under the building of it, so we had to be frugal with our budgets. Because <laughs> they weren't interested in building Trudeau's dream, but they wanted to make sure whatever was built would be on budget and target. The problem we met, though, was uh, Prime Minister's Trudeau frigate was only 80 million. <laughs> so when the new government came in, they said, uh, because I was told to follow the program, not the budget. Because it, so they came in and said, this is costing twice what it's budgeted for. I said, yeah. So what is the budget? I said, here's the quantity surveyor that said 200,000, 200 million. They'll, but we could probably squeeze it down to 165. Okay. And we built it for that. So and then, the, and then the, the public announced that we had doubled our budget. <laughs> and then all the politicians blamed it on us. So we carry that around, which is not correct. Because we, we have to build our buildings with budgets. Like, I mean, like that one in St. Albert. I mean, it's by plebiscite. It says, this is what the building's going to cost. You exceed that you're going against the law, you can't by a penny. So we've always had to work within these very restrictive budgets. So thank you <laughs> for Claire. Could I just do a brief, no, I think you've missed the, for me, you missed the point, what happened with the young architects here is I think we're afraid of beautiful design. I think that's why we're having the boxes because your creativity, obviously you've had a different vision, but for me it's addressing the fact that what about the client who you, provide a beautiful building under budget and they're embarrassed by it. That, that was my question. It, it's the, the public psyche that we're not allowed to have, the CAS is not allowed to have a beautiful building. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, and I don't know if you, you've faced that. What do I say? <laughs> well, um, I've, I've heard the same thing, that um, sometimes when a design comes forward, it looks very beautiful, and if it's for, um, for a public uh, sector client, they're concerned that because it looks so nice, it'll be seen as though they spent a lot of money on it, and, and they can't have that. So um, they don't want it to be as beautiful, and I guess the question is, have you encountered that, that yeah, uh, attitude? Yeah, that, that you know, when we did uh, Wabano Center, um, everybody said, oh my goodness, that's too beautiful for Indian people. <laughs> I mean, uh, and it's in, it's in uh, um, Vanier. My God, like, <laughs> we can't have, you know, that looks like it's too expensive. Looks expensive. Yeah, it looks expensive. And we, we can't have that image. No, well, why not? You know? I mean, uh, uh, you know, I, I mean, uh, yes, it may look expensive, but I mean, isn't that what we want? We, we go to winners or these places because we want. <laughs> we want really design, nice design for less. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. okay. I mean, where, where are we at thinking that, you know? We should look like we're cheap, you know. Look like we <laughs> look like we don't care about design in our buildings. Yet look at the clothes we wear. Look at the cars we buy. Look at everything else. Look at the art, you know. 
we've got to understand that uh, our buildings should be art. And we should look at a building and just say, you know, I mean, they used to do that up till the 30s. Look at the beautiful buildings, you know, Art Deco, Art, uh, art Nouveau. And what happened after Art Deco? I think that, you know, since the 30s, we haven't been really doing architecture. We've been doing boxes. I think we have time for one more question. Um, for so many of your buildings, you had such sculptural forms, which were very innovative. And you've talked a lot about how you used computers to do the drawings. And I'm wondering, could you comment on how you'd worked with the trades to convince them to build it when these were things they weren't used to building and these shapes were not used, were, were shapes that they weren't used to creating? And I mean, how, how to convince the trades? Mm -hmm. How did you get them to build things? Did they, did, they, did they say to you, you can't build that? And you had to work around that to get it built. Did they... Did you run into problems with these curved surfaces and, and them saying, uh, well, we can't insulate that because the insulation comes in flat panels or something like that? Did you encounter that with your um, designs? The thing that I encountered with the trades is, like, thank God, we're so sick and tired of building boxes. <laughs> You know, the Masons just love to bid on the work because they feel a sense of pride. And, uh, and, the, and the, also what they discover, they can do a curved wall cheaper than a straight wall. Because if you're doing a straight wall out of brick, you, uh, you, uh, you have to build it within one quarter inch and 20 feet, or else you'll see it. You'll see the fact that it isn't straight. But on a curved wall, you could be six inches out and nobody knows the difference. <laughs> so the funny part of it is the trade, the guys who, you know, Mason to build my buildings tell everybody, oh, it's so difficult, so difficult. <laughs> and then they, they come in with a low price all the time because they know that it isn't, if anyways. And, and then you get trades like uh, on the museum, there was a, um, uh, uh, a fellow laying the floors in the museum and he was laying them, everything, just as perfect as he could. And he would say, um, and I, I'd come there, and he was doing everything perfect. He says, I'm laying this floor for my grandchildren because uh, I want them, when, they're, when their children come to the museum, I want them to know that their grandfather you know, laid these floors. They're walking on the floors of my craft. You know, so even the drywaller, you know, when I'd come in the museum and, and I'd look at it and some of the drywall was out, I'd look at it and he'd put the light on it and the drywall trade looked at it for a while. Like, oh, yeah, that's not up to my standard, is it? I said, I don't think so. And, you know, we wouldn't have to argue with them because, you know, it's, it's part of our humanity. It's part of our soul to want to do the best of what we can do. But we're not giving all these trades and, and the people in our building industry that opportunity by building these awful boxes. Because there's just money will go so far. And, and then when a trade takes pride in their work, and all trades do this, then you give them the opportunity where they can really do something and feel good about it. The building I'm doing now, uh, in Saskatchewan, they, they build this, the, the masonry is made even more complex because uh, with our computer technology, we could do that. After the day, they sit there, stand there in the corner and, and, and look at their work in pride. And it's just perfect, you know? I say, you guys, you're doing such an amazing job, you know? So, you know, money has taken you so far, but I think doing something that you have great pride in doing, it makes you feel much better. Thank you, Doug. <laughs>